Good afternoon. I'm Venetria Patton, Harry E. Preble Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and a professor of English and African American Studies. I am so pleased to join you today for the LAS Dean's Distinguished Lecture. As a land-grant institution, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists. In order to remind ourselves and our community, we will begin this event with the following statement. We are on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Weya, Miami, Maskutin, Ottawa, Sauk, Muskoki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. It is necessary for us to acknowledge these native nations and for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution. Over the next 150 years, we will be a vibrant community, inclusive of all our differences, with native peoples at the core of our efforts. The College of LAS is home to incredible scholars who do groundbreaking research in the mathematical, life, and physical sciences, create important understanding of people, cultures, languages, and literature through the humanities, and further our knowledge of humans and human behavior across the social and behavioral sciences. Our diverse disciplines and people are united by our drive to question, investigate, and explore. The Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series, now in its fifth year, was created as an opportunity for us to indulge our shared curiosity. These lectures are a wonderful opportunity to learn from some of our outstanding LAS faculty members and to appreciate their innovative, creative perspectives. My hope is that after today's lecture, you will feel both enlightened and better connected to our wonderful community. We are so fortunate to have Professor Zayeda Luthi Shulton as our speaker today. You may know her as Zan. Professor Luthi Shulton is the Murchison Mallory Endowed Chair in Chemistry. She also is an affiliate professor in the Department of Physics, the Beckman Institute, and the Carl R. Woes Institute for Genomic Biology, and is a fellow of both the Biophysical and Physics Societies. She received her PhD from Harvard University and came to the University of Illinois from the Technical University of Munich. Professor Luthi Shulton is the director of the National Science Foundation's Science and Technology Center for Quantitative Cell Biology, which includes faculty from six disciplines, as well as industry partners and collaborators from Germany, the Netherlands, and Sweden. Her research team is widely known for using their GPU-based software to create simulations in four dimensions of a living minimal bacterial cell over its life cycle. I'm grateful she accepted my invitation to share her fascinating work today. And so I welcome you here um, in the um, ballroom with us and those of you who are joining us virtually via Zoom. And now Professor Luthi Shelton, please come to the lectern. Thank you very much. Uh, it was an honor to accept this invitation. Um, so uh, with the title, Bringing Cells to Life on a Computer and to Minecraft, I always notice people immediately want to know, what are you doing with Minecraft? And I'll tell you but at the end. Right now, I'm going to give you the examples of how we bring those computers to life on the computer. And we're going to uh, do it for this a minimal cell. And I feel more like the music director of a very, very talented symphony. And if you look at the names of the people up there, they are some of the leaders uh, in various aspects of it. So to begin with here at the University of Illinois, of course, it's my graduate students who are listed there, and as well as a colleague, uh, Angad Mehta from chemical biology, who can make these minimal cells grow anywhere and grow so well that then my biophysics colleagues can come here get them, stain them, do whatever they need to do, and then go down to IGB and image them. So we have data coming in from many, many different sources. Is this okay? I'm gonna move you a little bit closer. Okay. Just so that we can capture you. Are we talking in the gallery? 
All right. <laughs> okay. No, that's fine. And, and as I said, uh, when those colleagues come in, they're coming in from, like, say, Harvard to do this. Also, we have to get information about the, the shape of the cells. We get that from uh, any type of 3D imaging, cryoelectron tomography. And as you'll see later, there are an increasing number of techniques that can give us 3D information. And then finally, as I said, we, it's part of the test of our methods because for us to be able to simulate even a part of the cell cycle, we have to do a very much reduced uh, representation. And when we re uh, go back to doing a more atomistic approach, this multi-scale uh, problem, we then use and collaborate with the people in the Netherlands and Sweden who developed this very famous Martini uh, Gromax simulations. And I'm happy to say, so far, so good. Everything seems to be agreeing. So uh, let me show you this minimal cell. And again, those are the faces of everyone involved. This minimal cell is really, it's less than a half a micron across at its smallest size. And, uh, and then if you look at the gene map on the, on the far left over there, uh, each of those polygons indicates a gene that's in this system. And, but we also have this gene map uh, I can have them with different size that's proportional to the proteomics. I can tell you which ones are essential. So we know a lot about this cell. And, and we're going to concentrate on just a couple of the fields there. One is on the metabolism, and one is on genetic information processing. So for those of you who are not biophysicists or biologists, I mean by genetic information processing the DNA replication, the DNA transcription, as well as translation, so gene expression. Now you see that little part called unclear. That was the number of genes that we didn't know what they did when it was first published by my colleagues at the Greg Venter Institute. They developed this minimal cell by reducing a microplasma mycoides from about 800 genes down to less than 500. And, um, but still we didn't know every gene. And I'd like to point out there is no organism that anybody works on where they know what every gene does. But this number is far smaller than anything that's out there. I tell people, I, you'd have to twist my arm to make me work on E. coli again, because it has 5,000 genes and 1,700 of them. We don't know what they do exactly. So, you know, I know we have nice terms in physics, like a hidden variable. That just means we don't know, you know? <laughs> so I, I want to stay away from that. And I think we have a chance to really be able to simulate all the processes in this system. The other thing I want to point out uh, on that cell, that little cartoon there, uh, is that it's a very simple metabolic pathway, but, and you start with uh, ingredients, it doesn't make amino acids, uh, and even to do the nucleotides, you have to start bringing in nucleosides to do it. To make lipids, you have to bring in fatty acids. So there's a term for that, but I won't bore you with it, but I just want to tell you, it, you have to bring in a lot of things. So we have a rich but defined medium for this. Now, let's just go take a look at metabolism. And you can see we can put it on one page. I always make this joke, yeah, but you can't read it. But that's OK. Uh, the, each graduate student was assigned one of the subnetworks. And the whole map itself was developed by a postdoc, uh, Marian Breuer, who's now a professor in, in Maastricht. But you had to make the kinetic models. And that's what these uh, uh, graduate students were tasked with doing then we would meet and put the whole thing together. And it's interesting that these look like colored modules. And now there's a whole new area into stochastic thermodynamics where people are trying to simplify networks, put them into modules, and then be able to just sort of glue the modules together like Legos. We're not there yet, but it's a really interesting new direction that we're also looking into with some of the leaders in that field. Now, let's just concentrate on that center part of glycolysis. This is where the critter takes in food and then breaks down the glucose uh, into components that are then used to make the nucleotides and the lipids. Now, I always put this map up because I like to talk to my colleagues out of biochemistry to ask you, please quit teaching just the simple Michael ellis menten reaction that has one substrate being used by the enzyme to turn it into one product. There's almost no reaction in this cell that's like that. They all take at least two substrates and give you about three products. So if you don't know the order at which things come in, you have to use a random uh, binding model that was, thank God, developed by Liebermeister. We could use that. 
But also, the next problem is, where do you get the kinetic parameters for this? Now, they're stored many times, uh, they're put into a database in Germany. It's called Brenda, which makes no sense unless you know that Brenda stands for Braunschweig Enzymatische Datenbass. That makes lots of sense to me, <laughs> but, if, uh, but it, they're stored there. But you try to have to take all the knowledge that's out there and also in the literature and use machine learning techniques to sort of modify them for your system. But it's like with all machine learning techniques, you better test your answer by looking at you get the right free energy drops. And if you have suddenly have not made a reaction reversible or irreversible, that wasn't known to be the case. So as I said, uh, checking is really important. Now, just to give you an, uh, an idea about what we need for initial conditions, I'm showing you in the very top there uh, the tomogram, you, they've segmented the cell. The red dots are ribosomes. They'll become yellow in the other pictures, pardon me. But as you can see, oh my God, they're not located in any one particular place in the cell. They're not in the center or just on the periphery, so you have to weave the DNA in and around it. When we originally worked on the system, we tried to do what is called a lattice DNA model for it because we had imposed a lattice on to the entire cell to be able to manipulate reactions in different parts of the cell. Uh, we now have a continuum model that works much better and much faster, and I'll tell you about that just at the very end. But because we also know the protein counts, almost every gene coding for a protein, we know which ones are membrane proteins, we can put those in and then we put everything else, and now you're ready to start simulating. Now, because all those different subunits have different time scales and amounts associated with it, with things that are in small quantities, you have to use what are called stochastic methods. And for things that you have a large amount of them, uh, you can use even ordinary differential equations in such a small system. So you have to be able to come up with methods of actually integrating information from these various methodologies into your system. And, uh, so for example, in one of those subvolumes, if there's a ribosome there, that may push the particles out very quickly. Also, you can have reactions done within a subsystem. You'll use what is called just the chemical master equation for that. And then things can diffuse from one subunit to the next, and that's the diffusion operator. So the RDME, the reaction diffusion master equation, has those two components. But if you just want to treat their large quantities or even within the subvolume, you can use this chemical master equation. So everything has a label on it. Where is it in the cell? So you can handle heterogeneity. And now that we've brought in a continuum model for DNA, we move that using Brownian dynamics. So that's yet another method. Now, is this not easy, combining these methods? Um, people in computer science were just beginning to do that, but they always do just a few uh, reactions. You know, we're doing thousands of reactions. So we wrote a whole paper in the IE, the journal, of, uh, some uh, triple E journal, IET Systems Biology, where we worked out how often you have to communicate between these methodology, methodologies, and then what information gets exchanged. So do you tell them about the ends, the protein counts, the counts of the nucleotides? Uh, you can also uh, keep track of the ATP costs because we're also interested in energy economy. In fact, one of the things that drew me uh, to working on cell simulations is I used to take my daughter up to the University of Chicago where she was measuring, majoring in mathematics and economics. And you know, you kept re they kept getting these Nobel Prizes in, uh, in uh, economics and I would read their books and I go, yeah, the cell, it's just like a country. What comes in, what does it use, what does it give out? So I thought, clever way to think, start thinking about these things. You know, so that was, you know, sparked my interest of trying to do sort of a global picture of these things. Now, how are we doing so far? Well, when we published our first paper in Cell in 2022, I'm just going to show you the results for 20 minutes of the 110 minute uh, uh, cell cycle. Uh, that's such a short time that the cell does not grow substantially and the DNA does not start replicating. Uh, and so what you're gonna watch is just the fate of the messenger. So that's the, the message that comes off of the DNA, and then that'll eventually, there'll be a competition. It can be degraded by degradosomes, which the red dots on the surface, or it can go to a ribosome and be translated into a protein. 
So there's a competition going on between these two processes. And so you'll see the ribosomes change colors and the degradosome change colors. If you have really good eyesight, you'll occasionally see uh, the, the polymerase as it starts a gene. So now we just let that run for a while. And as I said, you're doing this for many different conformations of the DNA. And you start looking, say, maybe into this area. And you see, oh my god, the ribosomes were changing color. Uh, that means they're processing the messenger, making a protein. But then a, a nearby degradosome is also begins to change color. So if you watch these movies long enough and get the statistics from them, you can then come up with this plot here. You, I can tell you how many of the ribosomes are active, how many of the degradosomes are active. More importantly, the, and those actually have been estimated or measured in several systems, so we could see how well we agree with the values published for other bacteria. But the other thing I really like is the bottom curve. We could get the mRNA half-lice for all 452 uh, genes coding for proteins. And now it has not been measured for this minimal cell or for its parents, mycoides, so only uh, uh, maybe one or two of them, but uh, there are other uh, microplasm where they have been measured and it had a very similar distribution. The other thing that we came up with is how many proteins get made per messenger. And that number seemed pretty reasonable. So now we wanted to, with this success, we want to go forward. And this is what we are working on right now is we want to do the whole cell cycle because I think once we have all those reactions and the results from every species in that system, we can start thinking about what are the minimal rules of life. So just to remind you to do these 4D, so that's X, Y, Z plus time, whole cell simulations, we have to know the composition of the cell, we have to know its architecture, we have to know all the omics information we can, if you have super resolution imaging information on any of the processes, you can use that too. And we are very lucky to have a contact map for DNA, it came from Ramos Dame in the, in the, in the Netherlands. So, uh, and then when we move on, you have to have the reactions known, the diffusion coefficients uh, measured, and then you have to have a simulation method. And then most important, you better have one of the better GPUs because we want to do this for all 110 minutes and then get out similar curves like this. So let me just tell you briefly about now some of the genetic information processing systems. So uh, we're very fortunate uh, in that one of our colleagues from the Greg Venter Institute, it was Hamilton Smith, and he actually got a degree from here in an undergrad degree in mathematics. He went out to California and he decided he wasn't going to get the field prize in mathematics, switched into biology, and then shared the Nobel Prize for the discovery of restriction enzymes. So this was the ideal uh, collaborator. He knew biology, but he knew math, and we could talk to him about everything. The, our statistics, our algorithms, he loved every discussion we had uh, with him. And he also came up with this first picture of what happens, how do you start replicating the DNA? Well, it's double-stranded, and you have to open it up. So, and also, for those of you who are not familiar with bacteria, they have a circular DNA. But there's a place here, like the origin, uh, that should open first. And what helps you to open it is this protein has a terrible name, DNA A. Yikes. Um, uh, that, but it is a multi-domain protein. And there's part of it that binds to the double-stranded DNA. That's here at these nine nucleotide uh, signatures that you see here, and here are three in the row, in a row with a high affinity one in the middle. So we think, or we assume, it twists it that you now expose the single-stranded DNA, and then this part that's underlined are signatures that allow it to bind to the single, uh, allow the domain, uh, another domain of the DNA A, to bind to the single-stranded DNA. So uh, that's our model to get this bubble, and you can put in the replisome, and it starts replicating it. Where did we get the rates from this, you ask? Well, lucky us, somebody had done single molecule FRET measurements on it already, and we looked at those values. So they, if those of you uh, familiar with the FRET experiment, you have these two dyes, and if it's free to move, you'll have uh, a lot of FRET exchange here. If you start flowing in DNA A, and it binds and stiffens the single-stranded DNA, it moves the two dyes away, and that's a low fret state. 
So we used the rates from there. They seemed to work perfectly. And then the other thing that we did, you have a lot of polymers being made here. You have the DNA being replicated. You have the messenger RNA being made. You have the proteins being made. And you can use a similar model for each one of those. You just have to define what is the template. Is it the single-stranded DNA? Uh, is it uh, the messenger RNA? When what enzyme is helping you to do this? And then what are the monomers that are being added? Are you, make, are you putting on deoxynucleotides to make the DNA, nucleotides to make the RNA, or charged amino acids uh, uh, to make the protein? And so now how did we do on this? If we leave out diffusion uh, and we just look at the formation of the DNA, we could compare that directly to an experiment called QP, uh, qPCR. And let me just tell you, it, they're able to put a label on these two positions, A, the origin here, and then this midpoint called the termini, termini, and then you copy the DNA going in both directions. So you can come up with figures that look like two to one, three to one, four to one, or you can replicate the DNA and then start up the whole process again. So if you go over here and look at the ratio of origins to termini, the experiment would measure between three and 3.5, and what you can get from the theory or the simulations is around 2.5 to 3. So we're somewhat off, uh, and we're working to improve that. Of course, you notice the error bars are larger, and that's because we can only simulate with a you know, finite number of cells. But when they do these other experiments in the wet lab, you have millions of cells. So you have better error bars. And we can then predict the time dependence of every species in the cell. We can check whether we double the protein number when the cell is growing and just before it divides. But now, let me bring your attention to a few problems we had along the way. And that is even the simple picture of like nucleotide metabolism. So outside in that medium, as I said, you have to supply it with pretty rich things. So you better have the nucleosides in there. That, and, and then in a few steps, like one, two, three, oh my God, you're at the nucleotide you need. In the same way, you have to have the deoxynucleotides. Although there is a possibility to go back and forth between these two branches, this never carries enough flux for, you, for it to be satisfied. So those have to be in the medium as well. And then you have recycling of the messengers through those degradosomes that we talked about. And then, if all goes well, you should have a sufficient supply to get all the nucleotides you need for the messengers and for the tRNA. Same way over here, you should be able to get enough of the deoxynucleotides to satisfy the demands to replicate the DNA. So, of course, this machine, since it's been simplified, they knocked out almost all the regulatory elements in it. So, it can get into an imbalance so you do have to check the pool size. Do I have enough of any of these monitor, monomers or not? And that can influence the rate at which you have DNA replication, transcription, or translation. So if the majority of the cells, which are shown in, in, in gray here, from many, many runs are all right, you can still have some situations where you suddenly almost run out of the monomers, and those rates dramatically slow down. Um, and you can have even cell death. And we're very good at identifying that. Uh, and, but the trouble is, if you go back and then try to ask the experimentalists, can they determine how many of the cells die in their system? That's a hard question for them to answer. The other thing that we can do is also look at the ATP costs for everything, how much is made. And then the other important thing about that uh, glycolysis pathway, unlike other bacteria where you're, you're used to hearing the word maybe oxidative phosphorylation or photosynthesis. In that um, main glycolysis pathway, that's the only place you get ATP. So you have to see if the cell spends it wisely. So uh, that's cost and generation. Looks like it's balancing most of the time. Here we've normalized it. And the red thing, the, the, the line in, in the red box, I just put that there because nobody had ever measured how much ATP was used for all those active transport of getting those nucleosides and getting the fatty acids into it. The other thing that we're really proud of is you can look at the ATP cost, say, if you just replicate the genome once or if you have multiple. And then please notice, in this one it started at about 30 minutes. This one it started around 15 minutes. 
So making that filament is really a stochastic process. So sometimes it's very short and sometimes it's quite long. Now, uh, the other thing I, was, I wanted to tell you, and I think you can see already how we've brought in several, the information from several experiments, but the experiments can also be other simulations. So uh, a former student of my husband actually did a calculation about how to insert a membrane protein into the membrane. And he could tell us uh, how many ATP are used for every 10 amino acid, and gave us an idea about the rate at which you pull in the, uh, uh, the, the protein into the membrane. Again, we could pretty much just use what he had published, and, and then we were off. We have one last thing we have to bring up, and that is now the lipid metabolism. So this cell, uh, we grow it and we have it expand according to, only to our uh, lipid metabolism. Now, I think I showed you in the picture, it can bring in fatty acids, um, uh, say on this path, and it can make like two different kinds of lipids. It also is known uh, to be able to take up entire lipids if they're in the environment. But the amount that we have of these and way of checking our rates and productions is through this gentleman here at the TU Dresden, James Sense. He's a lipidomics expert, and his lab did experiments for us and gave us this curve so we could then compare our results. So we felt we had it modeled well. And then what do we do with that? We calculate the growth curves. How does the cell volume change? How does the surface area change? And we take into account not only the lipids, but also the membrane proteins. Because remember, this has a lot of transporters in it. And um, so then that's our final curve here. And if we look at when we sort of double the surface area, so that means we've grown up the cell, and then we've been able to divide it into two cells of original size, it sort of straddles the, the experimental measured uh, doubling time. Now, this part of the curve here and the, and the question mark, which I should perhaps make a little bit larger, uh, is that this is something we more or less assume, that after it doubled its volume, it, had under, it started to undergo symmetric cell division. There are other asymmetric scenarios, but part of the reason we did that was because when our colleagues from Harvard came, and got the cells from Angon Meta and went to IGB, look at what they were seeing. Um, so just to, so you know, they were able to label the, the DNA, the membrane, and then a, a protein that's involved in forming the septum, the dividing surface between them. And you can see here in the beginning state, when you're just beginning to elongate the cell, the DNA is there, but there's also some in the midpoint. But if you look at these, that's clear space between them, right? but it does look, to the most part, symmetric. There are some cells where there's some funny things happening, like a cell inside of a cell. And we don't quite understand that, but I think it's, again, because the regulation is gone, that many of the things that would help steady it to always have one outcome are just not existing there. So we don't have a good model for how the septum is being formed here, at least a good kinetic model. So we sort of imposed a symmetric cell division uh, on that last part of the simulation. We took the parameters from our growth curve and put them into what is known as a Helfrich Hamiltonian. So you can imagine just adding a term to, to this Hamiltonian where it involves the ratio of the surface to volume ratio. And if you minimize that energy function and its curvature, you can come up with a, this dumbbell shape here. And this does a rather good job, although at the moment the transitions are a bit sharper than we would like to have. And I can show you this for one of our simulations. Again, we're back here with the ribosomes and then we have a degradosomes on the, on the outside. So now we just wanna see what happens and, and track as we go along the volume change on the, uh, on the left-hand side there and then the surface change in the other bar. So you get to twice the volume and then it should undergo a transition, but not quite that sharp, and then because that Hamiltonian is solved using Monte Carlo techniques, you see the fluctuations coming in. Even this simulation it looks more or less symmetric. It, it, you can see already, and you get the numbers, that there are a few more particles on one side, like about 100 more or 150 more on one side than there are on the other. So that was a problem. 
The other problem, even though we have a very nice DNA model, that a continuum polymer model, uh, that we could put into the system, um, and not only do you have to have a, po uh, a DNA model, you also have to figure out how do I, you know, we can replicate it, that's not so much of a problem, but you have to be sure to be able to disentangle the thing as you grow. Now, in biology or most biological systems, you have two uh, essential proteins, which are, we also have retained in the system, called the SMC proteins uh, and the so-called topoisomerases. And here's a picture of what they do. So uh, if, if the thing that forms this uh, loop here, uh, it can ratchet the DNA through and you start bunching it up. Um, this can be two different sections of the DNA, but you realize that you're gonna come to a point where things get entangled. So that's where you need these uh, topoisomerases would help come in and break up this. And in sort of just to demonstrate, uh, I show this quick movie at the bottom here, that you have a knot. Um, and if you don't have topoisomerases, you just pull those sides tighter, that knot just stays. But if you have the topoisomerases, it will break the knot, and recouple the DNA. Uh, we as theoreticians just soften the potentials and let it pass through. So uh, this seemed to work quite well. And then if you look at our full DNA, and this is all 5,490, uh, 500,490 new base pairs, but we do it at 10 base pairs at a time, you can see it replicating. We did keep the volume just fixed here, um, but I'll let it run a little bit so you can follow it. And the, the ribosomes are there, but then I'll take them away so you can actually see the replication. So when it replicates, the, the daughter cell is gonna be from the black to the uh, whitish color. And yes, it's there, and you can see them distinct. But part of the problem is it doesn't really quite move far enough away, and we're trying to figure out what forces are we missing that would help with the separation of that better. So again, we've come far, we're here, and those parameters, gamma V are those parameters that we put in for various states of that simulation in the Helfrich Hamiltonian, but there's still a bit of bunching at the region where you should be forming the septum. So that's where we are at the moment, and we, th we have ideas how to handle this, but I think as we grow the cell, at least up to twice its volume, we have the ability now to stop at any point and go from our coarse grain picture uh, over on the uh, far side, which has about 200,000 particles because you know, we've treated 10 base pairs as a single bead. We've also just considered the whole ribosome. We don't have the individual atoms. You can then map it over to an all atom simulation, but then you have 500 million particles, or if you do it in full resolution, two billion particles. And that's what you use these Martini-Gromax simulations. So in this perspective that we wrote already in 2023, we showed that in principle you're able to do it, but there were some representations that were missing, so we're trying to complete that, uh, that conversion as quickly as we can. But what was important, we were also able to test out the DNA, and we got the same behavior, the same diffusive behavior, the same persistence length, so we're very pleased with that result. And for the people who would like to come and learn about the, these three different techniques, uh, we do have a workshop that we're sponsoring for our STC that'll be in May already. And just to give you a feeling of how exciting this is, this is what this uh, cell would look like with a so-called martini model. And the beads and the colors correspond to the different types of lipids. The, uh, I have to say the ribosomes and DNA look like spaghetti and meatballs, but um, that's okay. Uh, actually, a company in the European Union, because my colleagues in Europe were able to get a, one of the best, uh, highest uh, ERC grants uh, to be able to further develop these Martini-Gromax models for a cell of, on cell size level. And if you zoom in now to the cell, and now the lipids are all the same color, they're green, the proteins are this pink color, and we're gonna dive into the cell. And you can imagine, it's gonna be pretty congested. So we just selected a few things to show. Uh, and the few things we did, of course, was 
our DNA. We're very proud of that. So that worked really well. And then the ribosomes. So you can imagine, uh, and they're already trying to put this on these virtual reality glasses and put other features into it. So what I showed you was really the proof of principle that you could start attacking a host cell that led to us getting this new science and technology center. And it has a lot of people in it because you need not only multi-scale modeling, you need other experiments, and plus you need these fantastic industrial partners. NVIDIA has been a great help. A barrier makes one of the uh, newest state-of-the-art microscopes that allow us to track, uh, uh, has a resolution down to two nanometers, and we can track things with 0 0.1 uh, uh, microseconds. Um, and then plus my colleagues from Europe at the EMBL uh, at the Netherlands and in Stockholm. And of course, our supercomputer center is a, plays a really big role here, Betwick, particularly with our Swedish partners. I always make a joke. They just got 720 million to do what we're supposed to do with 30 million. And it's not quite fair. Uh, we're one quarter of their project, but they're supposed to also do like personalized medicine with this, but also set up the database because this is going to be an enormous amount of information coming out, particularly as we try to go forward to human cells. So we're talking back and forth with them and with NCSA how to be able to take this data. So let me just show you very quickly what's going on and get to the Minecraft. I know I don't want to have false advertising for this, for this talk. So uh, again, we want to be able to get a quantitative description of all the physical and chemical processes of the state of a cell at any time. And we do know this is going to take a combination of sort of new imaging and GPU accelerated computations. And I, uh, over here, I showed you the min flux and sort of the results that you can get from it. We're also doing label free measurements uh, of trying to look at the metabolites. And there you use machine learning to try and resolve that. And here's sort of some of the preliminary, preliminary results of the top 50 where they, you could distinguish them, but this was done in solution. It still has to be shown that it can be done in the cell. And then, of course, we have some of the best people doing cryo-electron tomography. Uh, the previous picture was of a microplasm. This is from the HeLa cell. And then here are the proud parents of this MinFlux microscope. This is Martin Grubler, the associate director of the STC. We're standing in front of, this S, uh, of the MinFlux microscope that's up at IGB. Um, I still look at it and I go, that costs 1.2 million and it's empty, right? Uh, but there's more coming into it and we'll be soon doing multicolors. So what about our move into eukaryotic systems? Even if our minimal cell was proof of principle, what do we have to do to go to larger systems like eukaryotes? Well, we already started to work on that. We have the metabolism down for, the, for yeast. We have tomograms from them. You can build up the tomogram from slices. Here you already see a, a, the nucleus and part of it. And then those holes in it are the nuclear pore complexes. You're seeing some of the ER and some of the mitochondria. And the really dark dots are the ribosomes. You can continue to build up. You get a structure. And then you do a test on this structure. Can you describe some reaction? We chose the galacto switch. And I can show you that because we're getting close to Easter. It looks like an Easter egg in our hands. And now you have a gene. I don't know if you can see it. It's turned off in the nucleus. It's red. And that gene that's turned off is the one that makes the, the transporters for galactose. So if you can get enough in initially to, turn, you know, to have that repressor come off the gene, then you can start making more transporters and you get more galactose. And the plots in the top there are showing you how the number of transporters go up from 1,000 to 15,000, and the amount of galactose goes up from zero to about six uh, millimolars in this system. And that agreed extremely well with the uh, experiments and as well as the, the chemistry that had been measured for this system. So now, as promised to the Minecraft, so once we have a cell built and we feel it's pretty realistic we try to turn that into a Minecraft picture so people really get used to looking at the real McCoy, so to say. So there you see the U of I tower. And the, uh, the avatar there 
looks suspiciously like one of my graduate students. <laughs> and if you try to do the galacto switch, uh, you can think of it as you're going to come into the cell. It should be a transporter. In this early version, okay, I admit, it was a set of stairs, because um, that was easiest for us to do. But you can come in, and then you can start diffusing around. We can add more features. We know where the ribosomes are, or at least a good approximation near the nucleus. You can, now we can also try fitting in the, the, the DNA into the nucleus. Eventually, you'll go in through one of those crosses, which are the nuclear pores. So there's a lot that you can do with this just to even teach biology. But more importantly, do some enterprising graduate students over in one of the colleagues in our STC, Stephen Bopart, we can also start comparing healthy and cancer cells. So this is a breast cell uh, that has can that it's cancers of three of the cells. And the avatar, it looks, does look a lot like Kevin, I have to say. And with the same technology, he now, well, the technology is he now used this microscope to do it and uh, to get a 3D picture. And you're seeing the, the cell boundaries, you're seeing the cell nucleus. Those large uh, red dots are the nucleoli that contain uh, a lot of the precursors of the ribosome because the cell is growing so fast it's making a large amount of ribosomes to be able to beef up the production of the proteins. So now you can enter this and follow the journey through his cancer cell. Now, I showed this at the BPS meeting about two weeks ago, and the uh, director from the National Cancer Institute came up, handed me his card, and said, I want to fund this. And I go, I've never had that happen to me. I said, <laughs> you want to fund Minecraft of a cancer cell? You know, and he goes, yes, they have an education division to, that they like to have it, a way to explain cancer and healthy cells to patients, particularly young ones, and they just think that this is a great idea to present the information that they have about your cells uh, to the patient. So, hey, far be it from me. As soon as we get this uh, Minecraft paper published or out the door, we will write this grant and uh, very happy to take their money. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let me just say one last word on another educational aspect of having this STC I think we're also going to see a slow transformation in soft matter physics. Because when you get into pro problems like cell growth uh, and start combining all these different processes, stochastic and deterministic, you're moving over onto this side of the uh, spectrum where you have to do non-equilibrium thermodynamics and stochastic thermodynamics, whether you're looking at particular machines inside of the cell or you're looking at entire thermodynamic, you know, uh, if you're looking at entire pathways and you're trying to break them down and understand the energy dissipation. So, uh, as I said, I'm very hopeful that this will also launch, you know, a sort of a new direction into soft matter physics because as, I, as the, the Dean Patton said, I do have an appointment also over in physics and so sometimes I feel this art, this division of Green Street between us and them is very artificial. And I look forward to really trying to have more uh, actions in, in common. And I would also say that many, the STC faculty, they are from like six or seven different disciplines all over the campus. So uh, we already have a history of being able to work well together here at the U of I. Very happy for it. And I've absolutely seen no boundaries whatsoever. So uh, I'm really hopeful as we go forward. And then let me just end by showing, again, the people who work just on the minimal cell, and that one wouldn't be able to do this without fantastic students and also uh, uh, collaborators throughout the world. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> I'd be happy to ask, is there any questions? Um, but normally people sit there stunned. <laughs> What went on, right? Uh, and the journalists only ask about Minecraft. It's really annoying, right? <laughs> and, and I know when this paper got reviewed in, in science, they go, computer mimics a cell. And I was so upset. What about all the other stuff we did in that paper? <laughs> but OK, I take it like it is. I'm just happy that they say nice things about the work. But uh, seriously, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. See? Good. Oh, ah, 
a question. See, I knew it. That's okay. Let me go back. Well, when we handed in the proposal, uh, you know, uh, with the science and technology centers, they want a, a, a broader impact to have a real impact, they say. So um, I think we all remember there had been programs when one was young where you could like travel through the cell in these cartoons. So we thought, you know, this would be great so we could put up the cells, and then if you're a biology teacher, you could teach them some of the biology. You could also naturally start bringing in a little bit of you know, information about, hey, some reactions that go on in the cell. So some of the colleagues, like in the STC, they're very much interested in this fission and fusion of the mitochondria. We could do that as well. And I have to admit, when Kevin first came to me and said, oh, I can bring in a breast cancer cell, I go, that doesn't sound like much fun, right? Um, but the, the truth of the matter is I didn't really appreciate that if you can put that side by side with a healthy cell, and that was one of the goals of our center, is develop these cell models, uh, let them respond to an environment, even just try to predict the, the distribution of behaviors you should see for perfectly healthy cells. So one of the things, because you do have these processes that are partly stochastic, part deterministic, you have no two cells are alike, right? And now, slowly, through the Chan Zuckerberg initiative, uh, the first one that was out in California, and, and that director was actually the judge of ours, so I, he said he really wanted to work with me, and I remember telling him, good, fund us, and I'm happy to do it. He sits on top of 500,000 cells from 20 different organs, from people at like two or three different ages. And that's an, when I say sits on these cells, he has the transcriptomics, and he now has the proteomics numbers for them. So suddenly, you're just overwhelmed with the amount of information that is there and can be used. Then if we go to the cancer cell, I have to say, when he showed this to me, I go, how do I know that's a cancer cell? And you know, we started talking about it, and then I talked to one of my neighbors around the corner, uh, Andy Belmont, he says, I wrote a review on that. And the, those uh, nucleoli tend to be bigger and denser in cancer cells because of the fact that they have to make uh, so many more proteins. And there are other characteristics that we'll take a look at. But this is, this is fresh. I mean, I'm just talking about having it done about a month ago. Uh, and this student was really great because what we had done for the proposal, as you know, software, you, boy, you always have to update it. And some of the first things we did were written in Python 2.7. Everything is now in 3.9. The editor we used to prepare it for Minecraft was MC Edit. It's really not supported anymore. And, and Kevin, I asked him to try out Amulet. He did that, and he came back on Monday and goes, look what I can do, right? And I go, wonderful, right? So I think now we are even talking to the uh, medical school about using this as a module to even show people, uh, uh, you know, the medical students, they're interested in it. So uh, it's win-win, and as I said, I knew nothing about that the Cancer Institute had a uh, educational branch, right? And like, great, teachable moment, as we say here, right? Mm -hmm. Well, when I look at the people that are involved, we have everything from microbiologists in this. Um, you know, as I said, people doing cryo-electron tomography. Those are still, you know, they might get a collection of cells and maybe they'll get a handful of different tomograms, but they're interested in can you start bringing these cells to life? 
So even when we did the minimal cell, we had enough tomograms, we could see what the ribosome distribution was at an early stage of the cell and one when it was at a uh, end of the cell cycle or close to it. Um, so you just start, I, I think we all feel like uh, many of the fields you work on just a particular part of the problem. With the cell model, you can bring everything together and then you start asking more questions like with, for us with the DNA, oh great, you can have repulsion of the origins. Most people have no problem with that. They, they think, oh, there's attachment organelle you know, for the origins, right? But how do you get it not only to disentangle, that we sort of have down, but move at a pace that's you know, sufficient to have it really separate into the other two? So we felt we had just forgotten some interactions, and we're pretty sure it's the interactions of the DNA with the membrane. And the more we read about that, that's somewhere that it can come in too. But I think to be able to do perturbations on these systems will help everyone. And, uh, and being able to bring in the information from so many different experiments, uh, people come to us and say, well, can you see this? Or can you give me the time behavior of this quantity? And then we go back and see if we can do that for them. Right? OK. Oh, OK, yes. <laughs> uh, in the very back, I guess. Uh, we have a question from our audience, mm -hmm. and it reads, have you been able to model molecular processes and coordination of membrane expansion over here? Uh, okay, uh, we, I mean, like, so because uh, we're using composite model, we do use the molecular details, mechanisms, to come up with our models. So like, as I said, like in that one case of the insertion of a membrane protein uh, into the membrane, uh, there was a membrane, there was this uh, translocase system, SecY, uh, there was the uh, protein going in, and that was done through a molecular dynamics uh, simulation. Uh, the, I didn't quite understand the last part about the membrane. I, quite often I get asked, do we have any, any elasticity? Uh, no. Um, uh, that comes in through, you know, roughly through the curvature, the helfer Hamiltonian when we use it, but out of our treatment, all we get is the formation of the lipids, the, and you know their insertion into the membrane, make the uh, the making of the uh, membrane proteins, and their insertion into the membrane. And we assume a simple uh, we don't differentiate for the different kinds of lipids how much area they take up. So those area curves are sort of assuming a certain area for each lipid and a certain area for each membrane protein but we don't have you know, tension on it. That has, that'll come in more through the Helfrich Hamiltonian and the curvature values that go into it. Okay. We have time for one more question. Thank you, Dan, for the great. I wondered if you were going to make your cells evolve or let them evolve and how you plan to go forward with that. Let our cells evolve, okay. That's a good question. I mean, one of the things we want to do is be able to run it for several cell cycles and to see how much it changes because, you know, it, it's never going to be totally symmetric cell division and some parts of it are always going to have more of this molecule than, uh, or this protein or this metabolite and that will lead to a different behavior, right? So we just haven't... Uh, we tried to do that, and we are doing it a bit with just the testing of the DNA, um, and that is already very interesting. You know, even the formation of the, the filament. Uh, when Hamilton Smith uh, was uh, sort of advising us, we thought we should make the filament look like if it's three nucleotides and we'd underlined about 90 nucleotides, it should be 30 DNA A. But one of the students showed, eh, you do that, you don't get the proper number of theta structures being uh, done. So uh, I think just looking at the variations and starting up the cell with what the cell had at the end of the cell cycle, and you can do this, and now we're getting these new Grace Hopper GPUs, which is supposed to give us another real boost in time, and if we can improve the rate uh, of the, you know, rate, if we can improve the DNA model, which at the moment tends to be the rate determining step in everything, so we're trying to accelerate that. 
I think we can move into a lot of those, those questions, uh, Rachel. I, I, I'm just trying to get the minimal cell done, you know, and uh, before I start, <laughs> the DNA in, in yeast scares me, right? And so I'm, I keep knocking on doors here. What do you know about it, you know, to sort of move into it slowly? The yeast metabolism, I already wrote a paper on it. We were 7.3 version of yeast, and I always liked yeast because when they started to study human cells, they used to use the yeast metabolism to mimic the human, right? So I thought, okay, there's a start. I'm going to be kicked off the stage. I can see well, this. Not yet. <laughs> so we do have a little token of appreciation oh. for you. And I'd like to ask everyone to please join me in thanking Professor Lucy <laughs> Foster. Thank you very much. Oh, that's very nice. Oh, okay. It's not a check. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you anyhow. <laughs> You're quite welcome. You're quite welcome. I'm just going to make a few um, closing remarks. First of all, I'd like to thank all of you um, in the audience, both in person and uh, with us virtually, for um, joining us this afternoon. And then also those of you who will watch this later online for being part of this wonderful um, event and making the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences the vibrant and engaging community that it is. And then also, um, I hope that today's presentation sparks new ideas and opens the door for more discussion. And for those of you that are here with us this afternoon, um, please join me in a reception um, right there in the back and to continue the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Yeah. I think you can understand some of it. I got your bag. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was really interesting.